Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. Hi, I'm Jody Ward. In today's Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, I'm going to go through the method of functional MRI, which is surely one of the most important scientific discoveries in neuroscience in the 20th century. So MRI can come in various forms, and there's a broad distinction between structural MRI and functional MRI. Structural MRI is looking at, for instance, the amount of grey matter and white matter in the brain. So these are long-term properties uh, of the brain. Whereas functional MRI is looking at moment-by-moment -moment changes in the brain, in this case caused uh, by differences in blood circulation. So in MRI, um, people put their heads in a giant magnet. The magnetic field of an MRI scanner is at least 10,000 times greater than the Earth's own magnetic field. But this is perfectly harmless unless, for instance, you might have a pacemaker or other metal in your body. When your brain's inside the magnetic field, protons, which are the H and H2O, um, start to align with the, uh, the magnetic field. So a small number of these protons will pull themselves in terms of their uh, alignment of their magnetic fields with the magnetic field of the magnet. What then happens is that slice by slice, a radio pulse, um, a radio frequency wave is applied to the brain. And this pushes the protons, the H and H2O, to 90 degrees from their original alignment. And this is the key essence of how we create the MR signal that's used uh, in fMRI and also structural MRI. So as the radio wave is applied, the protons go to 90 degrees and then they spin or precess uh, in that particular plane. Then they get pulled back into the normal alignment by the magnetic field, and this is called relaxation. But the protons will relax at different rates depending on whether they're in white matter or grey matter. And we can use this as a basis of constructing grey matter and white matter maps of the brain in structural MRI. And this is what's called the T1 component. So it's to do with the way that the protons relax into their original state. What's also found is that as the, uh, the protons are pushed into the 90 degree state by the radio frequency waves, that there are local interactions with other molecules that are around in the brain. And in particular, deoxyhemoglobin has certain magnetic properties that distort that signal. When this was first discovered, it was thought, well, this is a kind of nuisance variable that we don't want. But actually, it turns out that this is absolutely crucial uh, for producing fMRI because deoxyhemoglobin is an important signature that is related to neural activity. So this other measure to do with distortions of the MR signal by deoxyhemoglobin is the basis of functional MRI. And this is different from the signal used in structural MRI, even though it's all part of the same uh, system. So fMRI is based on the relative amounts of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in the brain, in particular regions throughout the brain. And in effect, we're using this particular signal as a, a proxy measure of neural activity. Full runners to fMRI would inject people with radioactive tracers and then look at where the radioactive tracer was distributed in the brain to figure out which parts of the brain were more active. But we can use what's called a natural contrast agent in terms of these blood-based um, signals. So fMRI is also called a hemodynamic method. Uh, because we are measuring uh, properties of blood flow and blood oxygen. This also means that we're not really measuring neural activity directly. We're measuring something that is a downstream consequence of neurons firing. So how exactly do, does the firing of neurons, the thing that we're really interested in, affect the blood supply and the blood oxygen? Well, we can think of this happening in three different stages. So first of all, as neurons become active, for instance, because they're responding to the sight of a face or because a person is trying to speak, 
then what happens is the neurons consume oxygen. The brain doesn't store its own oxygen supply, so it needs to get it from the blood. So as neurons fire, they consume oxygen, and oxygenated, um, oxygenated blood gets converted to deoxyhemoglobin. And that's the initial stage of this particular process. But it's not the main signal that we use in fMRI. And this is the second stage, which we call overcompensation. So what happens is, is that the, um, the blood supply is in a fine balance, and as soon as you start consuming oxygen, it tries to supply more oxygen into that region. And in fact, it does this by overcompensating. It supplies far more oxygen than is actually needed. So this leads to the paradoxical situation of as the parts of the brain consume um, oxygen, you end up with more oxygen in the region and not less because you are overcompensating for the use of oxygen. And this is the signal that we're measuring in fMRI, and it's called the BOLD signal, blood oxygen level dependent contrast. And this is due to uh, the capillaries in the brain expanding, so they dilate, they, they grow bigger. The capillaries run all the way throughout um, the brain, a very fine vasculature with this. And the final stage is that eventually the veins will um, dilate, so that, this is called an undershoot, and the veins are obviously uh, carrying the deoxy, um, uh, deoxygenated blood, and this will go in the opposite direction. But the main signal that we're looking at is this bold response, this overcompensation. This whole cycle is called a hemodynamic response function, or HRF. Note that the HRF takes around uh, six seconds to peak, depending on the size of the magnet. This is quite a slow process. If you think that our thoughts happen on a millisecond scale, or perhaps a second scale, that basically fMRI is always playing catch up. It's ha not happening in real time. It's, um, it's occurring several seconds after the, the cognitive activity itself. So we say that fMRI has a relatively poor temporal resolution but it does have a very good spatial resolution, down to millimetres or centimetres, depending on how we analyse our data. So I've described how changes in neural activity drive this change in the bold response. But how can we use this bold response in order to study cognitive processes in the brain? One of the key things to realise is that the brain contains uh, many regions, each of which uh, has their own particular speciality. So for instance, whilst we're viewing faces, only some parts of the brain will show an increase in the bold response and most will not. And in effect, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to figure out which parts of the brain are particularly responsive to certain stimuli or tasks or certain aspects of cognition that we're interested in. And what we're doing is that we're ultimately creating images of statistical significance. So we're looking at each and every region of the brain and saying, for instance, which part of the brain responds significantly more to faces. And if we think it does respond significantly more, then we colour that part of the brain in. So the beautiful maps of the brain that we see um, coloured in are not maps of neural activity, nor are they maps of blood changes or hemodynamic responses. What they are are maps of statistical differences. Uh, that are linked to the particular cognitive processes uh, that we're studying. What this also means is that the data that we get from fMRI is not foolproof. They're statistical methods. So that, um, if we see something as being significantly activated, it might be a true uh, positive result, but it could potentially be a false positive result, depending on how we analyse and set our statistical thresholds. It also uh, depends on having good experimental designs. And one of the key things about a good experimental design is to have very clear questions and also to have very clear baselines. So one reason why a baseline is very important in these studies is that the whole brain is always physiologically active. What I mean by that is that neurons are always consuming oxygen, uh, otherwise they would die. So what we're looking at are relative changes in the bold response rather than um, a, a change from zero because the, the brain is never at zero, it's always doing something. 
Uh, but the question is, is it doing more in particular uh, cognitive situations when we give certain stimuli or tasks? So let's consider a concrete example of trying to find brain regions that are responsive to the sight of faces. What we might do in our fMRI scanner is that we show participants a series of faces over time. In between those faces, perhaps we have a blank stimuli, for instance, so just uh, we don't see anything at all. What we would then have is that we can predict how we would expect the brain to respond. And we can do this because we know uh, what a typical hemodynamic response is. Uh, it has this particular characteristic shape. So if we were to present faces, for instance, uh, every four seconds with some blanks in between, then we would expect the hemodynamic response to uh, follow that particular pattern. So although it takes uh, 16 seconds for the hemodynamic response to go to baseline, in effect, if we present stimuli at a faster rate, say every three or four seconds, these hemodynamic responses will add together uh, uh, with, with this. And so we can look at the sum of the responses with this. So in effect, what we get is that we get a particular pattern that is specific to our experimental design um, due to the timing of our stimuli and this characteristic bold response in the hemodynamic response function. And we're effectively asking, which parts of the brain show that particular expected response? And if they show that particular expected response, then we colour that part of the brain in. And this is how we generate those uh, colourful statistical maps that we see in papers. In this particular example, we're using as our baseline no visual stimuli at all. And of course, that is not an ideal stimulus uh, uh, baseline for our particular experimental question, because not only will we identify parts of the brain involved in seeing faces, we'll identify parts of the brain that respond to any kinds of visual material. So a better baseline here might be to compare faces versus houses, rather than faces versus blanks. But even here, perhaps there are differences between the material. Maybe our houses tend to have more fine-grained detail, whereas our faces don't, for instance. So maybe we have another kind of baseline. Maybe we have scrambled faces. So we take an image of the face and we rearrange all the pixels, for instance. So here we're certain that, for instance, the average brightness of the image is going to be matched. But again, is this a good baseline? Perhaps not, because here we've lost, for instance, all the information about the surfaces or how things are connected together. So each of these three experiments would yield a slightly different sets of uh, brain regions that appear to be implicated, even though they're all supposedly asking the question which regions are involved in seeing uh, faces. So how do we get around this? Well, again, one way in which we can do this is a kind of meta-analysis or a conjunction in which we compare these three experiments and say, which of these three has uh, um, which brain regions are in common in these three different uh, experiments. And here, this will get at the question which regions are responding to faces no matter what the comparison stimuli, uh, for instance. And that would be one approach around this. But ultimately, we have to think very carefully what's our research question, and we have to have it precisely specified so we can choose our appropriate stimuli and our appropriate baselines.